The harlot system in the book of Revelation is a system that will be in existence and in full rebellion when the Lord Jesus Christ returns. It would be completely naive on our part to believe that this system has changed or has diminished in this modern world. It has lost its temporal power, its physical rulership over those papal states in the area of Europe, but nonetheless, it has adapted its techniques, and although it might be singing a slightly different song, it is the same system that is awaiting the righteous judgments of Almighty God in heaven. When we consider the words of Revelation chapter 9, where it says there that neither repented they of their murders, nor their sorceries, nor their fornications, nor their thefts, we realize that though the trumpet judgments, as it was preceding this, came upon this system, that it did not turn away from its evil. It hasn't learned from the judgments that God has brought upon it. It remains the same in character and action as it always has been. And just because God has brought the temporal punishment, or the, the punishment against its temporal power against it, does not mean that it will be diminished at all. If we think of the words of Daniel in describing the little horn system that we have looked at somewhat in the other classes, we read, I beheld the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them until the Ancient of Days came. So that system makes war with the saints until the Lord Jesus Christ arrives in the earth to do away with it. And that war has been a physical war as we have looked at in our previous class, but it is also a mental and a moral law, a law that is a warfare that takes place as it's described as against spiritual wickedness in high places by the apostle. We also read in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 8, Then shall the wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. So it's not until he comes that the system is completely and absolutely taken away. So let's not be deceived, brothers and sisters, or for a moment give up our God in thinking that the system is in somewhat of an abeyance today. When we consider the age in which we live, it's really the climax of human destiny, the climax of the kingdom of men, I guess you could call it, upon the earth. We think of the prophecies that converge together. Revelation chapter 17, the harlot woman riding the beast. Daniel chapter 7, Daniel chapter 2, the little horn of Daniel chapter 7. And all these things are a picture to us as sort of summarized in that grand scheme of Daniel chapter 2 of the things as he puts it in verse 28 that would be in the latter days. Daniel 2, verse 28, There is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets and maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. That's what this picture was. Although it spanned a great system or a great series of, of history and time, the actual picture that Nebuchadnezzar was looking at was what would be in the latter days. And the indication was that it would be Babylonian in, in its head. And so when we come to the book of Revelation, we find there the apostate woman who is described for us in Revelation 17, the woman that sat upon the scarlet-colored beast, full of the names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns, going back to Daniel chapter 7, arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones, pearls and having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. And upon her head... Uh, forehead, a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, the abomination of the earth. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus, as we looked at yesterday. So we're looking at what shall be in the latter days, and this is the last phase, really, of that fourth beast that would be there when the Lord Jesus Christ comes to destroy it. And it's in control, this apostate woman is, of the European system, the European beast. The composite picture, really, in Revelation 17 is of these two things working together. She is no longer in control of her own physical territory, as she was in times past, but now she is basically guiding and steering, as we think of somebody who rides an animal. This animal, this unclean animal, as God sees the kingdoms of men, and it is the form of what is going to be in the latter day. The fact that it's called Babylon, mystery, Babylon the Great, 
is something that is very providential for us. It reaches right the way back, of course, to Babylon of old, going back to the time of Nineveh, the time, uh, sorry, of Nineveh, of Nimrod and Semiramis, the woman and the man-child, as is explained to us in um, the, uh, the books that we read and, and get the background to these things. Genesis chapter 10, verse 10, we read the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, which of course means confusion. We read, let us make man, or sorry, let us make us, as man says, a city and a tower whose top may reach up to heaven. Let us make us a name, lest we be scattered. And that, of course, is the pride of man elevating itself, to which, of course, the Elohim responds, let us confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. And so it is, brethren and sisters, that that's the system that will be in the latter day. Have the spirit of Babylon, the spirit of rising up in the face of Almighty God, the spirit basically of saying that it can reach up to heaven. And so it is that we see Babylon arising today. It is interesting that when the European Union began, really, it was at the impetus of the papacy The Pope on Monday urged the nations of Europe to create a real federation and the 78 members of the assembly drove from Rome to Castle Gandolfo to receive an audience by the Holy Father before beginning their sessions. And he tells them that a new road in all domains and an enrichment not only in economic but also cultural and spiritual and religious roads would be made. This was the papacy pushing forward for this idea of a united Europe. The woman basically riding the beast, involved in these things at the very beginning. Here is the signing of the Treaty of Rome. We've probably seen this picture before, but have we ever bothered to look at the background? Because there is a statue presiding over the whole thing of the Pope. Because this, of course, was in one of the papal palaces, and you can see all the frescoes on the wall. The Treaty of Rome that would give birth to Europe, the European Union, signed basically in the headquarters of this system in Rome. And so it is that the European Union, under this papal influence, has been constructed in a way that it echoes that of Babylon. The audacity when this poster, um, there's Babylon of old, and if we just sort of see the transition, this poster that came out years ago that you've probably seen by now, how that there is Europe, many tongues, but one voice. The idea of undoing the curse of the Tower of Babel, depicting themselves as Babel or Babylon, showing that they basically are all nations come together, united, but this time they have one voice. Although the angels have tried to divide them, mankind has decided that he has undone this. And this isn't just a zealot, radical, graphic artist who got a little carried away with his imagery. Of course, if you go to Europe today, the structure has been built into their parliament building. This is it. An unfinished building made exactly in the image of that ancient painting of Babylon itself. The Revelation tells us that this great superstate rising in which the Vatican is to preside over would have that influence of Babylon in the forehead. This is what Daniel saw, or Nebuchadnezzar, that would be in the latter days. So let there be no mistake, brethren and sisters, that that is what is rising in Europe today. Now our intention is not to spend our time looking at the political system of Europe, but rather to spend our time looking at the system of Babylon the Great, the woman, the harlot, and how that they repented not, And as we go through the book of Revelation, we we notice that there are many signs and symbols, things that are attributed to this system. And it's important for us to realize that as you go through and catalog these things, they haven't gone away. They haven't changed. They haven't been removed. They are still there in their full impetus. We have been given clues to help us identify this system of the apostasy. And of course, one that we're very well familiar with is the geographic clue, where we read that here is the mind that hath wisdom, the seven heads on which the woman sitteth are seven mountains, Revelation 17, verse 9. 
And were the Apostle John to reach into his pocket during the time of receiving the book of Revelation, he may have been able to pull out this very coin, minted during the time of Vespasian. And look on the other side, and there's Vespasian's head on the one, and on the other, there is a woman sitting on seven hills. It would have been pretty easy for him to identify who the system was. And, of course, you can go to Rome today, and you can buy a tourist map to show you the seven hills upon which Rome sits. And if there is any doubt whatsoever, the geographical location is given to us with clarity, this great Babylon that is depicted in this way. And so there's one of the simple clues for us to help us in the identification of this system. Well, the other character of the apostasy that we looked at was that of being deceptive. We looked at this through the letters to the Ecclesias. How that we read in Revelation 2, verse 2, these are those that say they are apostles and are not, but has found them liars. That was the character that would be developed fully. These were those in Revelation 2, verse 9, the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. And that does not mean, brethren and sisters, that they were Judaizers. What that means is that they said they were the Israel of God. They were claiming to be inward Jews, ones who were circumcised in heart. But, of course, we recognize that they are not. Revelation 3, verse 9, them of the synagogue of Satan that say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. So the deceptive character of this system is there for us. And it's seen in the things that it teaches, the doctrines which it holds. They are, I would say for us, almost unbelievable. And perhaps as a community, a Bible-based community, we don't really think a whole lot about what the Roman Catholic Church actually teaches and what these people actually believe. Because if we were to do that, as we intend on doing for the next few minutes, we will see that it is indeed sorcery and deception par none else. If we go back to the book of Daniel for a moment, we've been looking at several prophecies. We've looked at Daniel chapter 7 and saw how that the system would arise out of there. We've looked at Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, which of course is really the Apostle Paul's Bible class on Daniel chapter 11. Beginning at verse 36, there is the king that does according to his will. And it goes on to say that he will exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, speaking marvelous things against the God of gods. Of course, we relate that to the words of Thessalonians. He as God shall sit in the, in the temple of God, pretending more or less that he is God. And so we correlate these two prophecies together as Daniel, or the Apostle Paul, gives us an exposition of Daniel chapter 11 and verses 36 and on. But if we come down to verse 38, it says, In his estate shall he honor the God of forces. Now this is an interesting little passage, really. He will honor a different God. It says that he won't honor the God of his fathers, but he's going to honor the God of forces. And there's a terrific little section in the exposition of Daniel by Brother Thomas on this. And we'd just like to illustrate a little bit of this because it speaks to the sorcery of this system. We read there, in his estate, he shall honor the God of forces, which is the fortress or the protectors, the protector gods. A God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor or laden with gold and silver and precious stones and pleasant things. So when we look at the church today, we say, well, is that what it does? Does it honor protector gods, something that the pagan system that would come, or it would proceed or follow after, would not basically have known a whole lot about. Well, we find that the early adoption of the apostate doctrine included that of the immortality of the soul. And tied into this was the idea of dead saints, quote unquote, would be able to effect salvation to those who prayed to them. They believed that they were ascended to heaven, so they should be invoke, able to invoke their help in whatever circumstances they had in life. Now, when we go through and follow this, to me it becomes absolutely incredulous that people can be duped into believing this. But this is the way the system operates. This is John Christosom, a homily on the martyrs of Egypt. He says, The bodies of those saints 
fortify the city more effectually for us than impregnable walls of adamant uh, and like towering rocks placed around on every side repel not only the assaults of the enemy that are visible but the insidious stratagems also of the invisible demons and counteract and defeat every artifice of the devil as easily as a strong man overturns the toys of children. So bodies of dead people, when collected together and put in significant places, will actually serve as a protection for a city, stronger than, in fact, an army would. This was the belief. Now, John Christensen is writing quite a long time ago. But if we were to move a little bit into the future, to the 1545, the 1563 period, we have the Council of Trent, the great anti-Reformation council. And during this time, the council solidified this idea. Holy bodies of holy martyrs and others now living with Christ, believing they had ascended through heaven going, which bodies were the living members of Christ and the temple of the Holy Ghost and which are by him to be raised to eternal life and to be glorified are to be venerated by the faithful. For through these corpses many benefits are bestowed by God on men. And if we believe that this is something from a time gone by then all we need to do is follow the news. Because here is Pope John Paul standing next to the cat or kneeling and praying to the casket of this man here. Now you may remember we made mention of him yesterday, or yeah, I believe it was yesterday, Archbishop Stepanitz of the Yugoslavian Catholic Church, who was responsible for the murder of some 600 or 700,000 people. A war criminal that was tried under Marshal Tito and sent to jail. And John Paul found it necessary to take this man and to beatify him, to make him into a saint so that the faithful could come as he does here, kneel next to his rotting or dried out corpse and pray to it to have assistance in the things of their lives. In fact, there is a whole wing of the Vatican, a whole department that dedicates itself to this. The Office of the Relics in the Vatican itself to catalogue, to validate and to distribute little bits and pieces of the departed saints to be sent out to each of the churches. It's a gruesome thing, really, and it's more stunning is that it's incorporated into every single Roman Catholic Church on the face of the earth. Because part of sanctifying the church is that it must contain the body or bits of the body of one of the saints. It is gruesome, but it is fact. The altar cavity. This is the Catholic Encyclopedia, 1908, Volume 1. This small square or oblong chamber in the body of the altar in which are placed, according to the pontifical Romanum, the relics of two canonized martyrs, especially of those in whose honor the church of the altar is consecrated. These relics must be actual portions of the saints' bodies, not simply their garments, the relics must, moreover, be authenticated by the Vatican Department of Relics. Bodies and bits and pieces of these people taken and put into the Vatican or into whatever church it may be. Your local Catholic church on the corner has such things. Well, do you remember this guy on the right-hand side here? Jolly old Saint Nick. Well... We've tracked down jolly old Saint Nick, and here is his reliquy, as they call it. That is the final resting place of Saint Nicholas, who can be prayed to as the patron saint of children. Why would he be the patron saint of children? Well, because it was Santa Claus who miraculously reassembled the bodies of three children who were murdered, dismembered, and put into different pots and brought them back to life. And based on that miracle, 
He has become a saint of the Roman Catholic Church, the saint of children. Well, it might not be St. Nicholas. There could be other bits and pieces that you would like to pray to and would honor with jewels and with gold and with silver, as the words of Daniel chapter 11 point out to us. Here, this little reliquy is the final resting place of the bones of somebody's hand or the foot or whatever bit or piece it might be to ward off the evil spirits. And brethren and sisters, we have to realize that that is the system that we are up against. It is a system of sorcery. And John Paul II, and I owe this to Brother Colin who handed me this this morning, from the Catholic, um, sorry, from the Adelaide Advertiser, I believe it was last year, Pope John Paul II seems to be hell-bent on making as many saints as possible. He has made a record 473 saints and another 1,282 are in the queue. Queen Isabella of Spain is in the offing. Of course, we learned about Queen Isabella, didn't we? The one who set in motion the Spanish Inquisition to consign thousands to their deaths. This man has canonized more quote-unquote saints than any other pope in the history of the Catholic Church. In fact, he's canonized more saints than there ever were saints. So the words of Daniel chapter 11, talking about the king who will do according to his will, they're not sort of moldy old history. That's current stuff. Because this man has taken it to a much higher level than anybody in the past ever did. Sorcery. That was the other characteristic we read about. This idea of seducing the servants. We started off in Revelation chapter 2, verse 20. That was one of the characteristics, yet developed to its fullest. We come to chapter 16 in verses 13 and 14, and we read that there are these spirits that go out working miracles to the kings of the earth and the whole world. We read the same character in Revelation chapter 9 and verse 21. They repented not of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornications or thefts. We read in Revelation chapter 12, verse 18, that the precursor of the system would deceive the whole world. And 13, that there would be all these different miracles that would be done. And so when we look at this system, we find also a parallel in Daniel chapter 8 and verse 25, where we read... Through his policy he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand and shall magnify himself in his heart. The word there, craft, means deceit or guile. So in his hand, deceit would be caused to prosper. And of course, one of the great miracles of the Catholic Church is that of the Eucharist, the host which they believe is turned into the body and blood of the Lord Jesus Christ when the priest offers his magical incantation over top of it. The incantation of hoc est corpus, the Latin phrase for this is my body. It's actually the original phrase for the corruption that we know today as hocus pocus. And so there it is, in obedience to the words of the priests, Hocus corpus meum, God himself descends on the altar and he comes wherever they call him and as often as they call him and places himself in their hands. This is the sorcery of the Roman Catholic Church. That as the priest stands there with that death cookie in his hand, that basically God himself would become part of that as he distributes it amongst those around him. And so we read in Revelation chapter 18, verse 23, By thy sorceries were all nations deceived. Oh, how very great is their power! A word falls from their lips, and the body of Christ is then substantially formed into the matter of bread, and the incarnate word descends from heaven, is found really present on the table of the altar, Never did divine goodness give such power to the angels. The angels abide by the order of God, but priests take him into their hands, distribute him to the faithful, and partake of him as food for themselves. 
That is the sorcery which this nation, this system goes out and deceives the nations of the world. It's absolutely incredulous, really, when you stand here and just think of the logic behind that. That this man, through a magical incantation, can call down God himself to be present in this cookie, that when they put it on their tongue, it literally turns into the body and blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Ridiculous. But that is what they deceive all these people with. It was for that reason because our brethren and sisters of the time of the protesters refused to participate, refused to take the Eucharist, that they were put to death. And you can understand why they refused to do it, because this bears no resemblance whatsoever on the truth as it is in Christ Jesus. Revelation chapter 19 and verse 20 talks about the false uh, prophet that wrought miracles before him. This is uh, a church outside Quebec, displaying the crutches of those who have been miraculously healed. Well, one of the most high-profile miracle sites in the world, supposedly, is that of Lourdes in France. It was here that there was a a vision, supposedly, of a young girl named Bernadette of the Virgin Mary. And the faithful believe that the waters of the fountain here have power to cure. There's a magic power in this water, so much so, we print a a paper at work called the... um, the uh, Catholic, um, I can't remember the name of it now, National Post, it's, it's the, uh, the Catholic Times or something along that lines. And there's all ads throughout this thing. And in the ads, you can buy rosary beads made out of, you know, special plastic filled with water from Lourdes. So when you're doing your prayers, you're actually praying over the magical water that the Virgin Mary has blessed over in Lourdes, France. And it's not as though this is just something that a few zealot Catholics get into. The Pope himself is there to pray at the shrine in Lourdes. And we read in the newspaper that just recently there was a ruling that declared a 12-year-old healing that was an, to be an authentic miracle. The 66th such declaration at this shrine, a 51-year-old man with multiple sclerosis who was unable to walk and talk, recovered just hours after bathing in the famous Miraculous Springs in 1987. Those are the types of miracles that millions believe in, that millions flock there as a pilgrimage. Well, one of the other identifying characteristics is that of wealth. And of course, all we have to do is look at the system to see that indeed it is a very wealthy system. The woman that was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. And here is the last, one of the last popes, this would be... uh, this would be Pope Pius XII, carried around like an Egyptian god. Brethren and sisters, let there be no mistaking this system. The Lord Jesus Christ washed the disciples' feet, and yet this man is carried around by men, raising himself up as though he were God himself upon the earth, clothed with fine linen, purple, gold, scarlet, precious stones, when you only take Brother Ron Abel's book and read through the man of sin to see the weight of gold and the different things that are involved in the jewelry that it touts. What other religious system, I ask you, even can hold a candle, pardon the pun, to this type of thing? What other system is there in the world that has such wealth and such jewelry and such gold and such riches as the Vatican City? It lives out both literally and symbolically, the words of having a golden cup in her hand full of the abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. The idea of her merchandise being that of gold and silver and precious stones and pearls and fine linen and purple, silk and scarlet and all these different things it lists off, precious stones, wood and brass and iron and marble, cinnamon and odors and frankincense and of course down the bottom there, the real thing which is slaves and the souls of men, because that's what the system wants. Just incidentally, notice the metals that are involved here. It picks up on gold and silver and brass and iron and marble, which I guess you could say is somewhat like clay in a different form. But that is the metals, of course, of Daniel's image, is it not? Or Nebuchadnezzar's image. And this system is there trading in souls of men. 
It's a very powerful system, that there be no mistake of that, brethren and sisters. It's described as the great city in Revelation chapter 18, verse 16. And I don't think you can find another city on the earth that will parallel it in its opulence and splendor. The waters, we read, of the city, where the, or the waters which the whore sits upon, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues, boasting perhaps the greatest religious following to one man on the planet. And so we see this system fulfills the words, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication. Let's just turn up two passages. Let's go to Revelation chapter 17. Verse 18, The woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. Not used to reign, but does reign in the time period of Revelation 17. Revelation chapter 18, verse 3, All nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And so this system is unparalleled. How many world leaders do you suppose the Dalai Lama has met with over the last little while? Who else is there that has such influence over the world that would be asked to come and speak at the United Nations or to open the European Union or to be consulted by power after power after power Western, Eastern, European, Middle East interesting by the way that the person that has met the Pope the most times out of all the world leaders is Yasser Arafat which really makes you wonder not really wonder, I suppose, gives a big hint as to what's going on in the Middle East and why, and who's behind all the problems that are over there. But that's this system, brethren and sisters. It opposes and exalts itself above all that is called God or is worshipped, so that he as God sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. What other system is there that mankind fall down in obeisance before it, on their faces, prostrate before a man, who claims himself to be the Lord Jesus Christ incarnate on the earth. Let's not be deceived that this system is extremely intoxicating. You would think, looking through those things, that Protestantism should be easily maintained. The signs and the symbols are so very clear. So many books written sort of contrasting the two things. Back at the time of Martin Luther and Tyndale and some of the early Reformation, even done in cartoon format so that the, the average person could see pictures of the Lord Jesus Christ washing the disciples' feet and then you've got the papist kissing the Pope's feet. All those types of things side by side. The Lord Jesus Christ who had nowhere to lay his head and the Pope living in such splendor. They, they recognized and pointed those things out very clearly. And yet we find that this system would be one of intoxication. All nations will drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And not only that, but 17 verse 2 of the Apocalypse says they will be made drunk with that wine. They will be intoxicated, inebriated by it. And they have all drunk chapter 18 and verse 3. And so when we look around the world and we see that we are becoming perhaps a dying breed to actually stand up and say this is the man of sin. What about Tyndale? And the group that, I guess you could say, Henry VIII, came from those initial things of having the Bible in their hand, recognizing the papacy as being the man of sin. In fact, if you take your King James Bible and turn to the very front, and I don't know if you've ever bothered to do this, but you read the preface, right in there it talks about the writing of this book the putting together of this translation will level such a blow against the man of sin, meaning the papacy, that he will never rise again. That was the spirit of the people of the time. And yet, what do we see today? But the very church founded by Henry VIII, apostate church, no doubt, one of the daughters, perhaps the, well, I guess the second closest to it, going back to Rome. The queen, who is supposed to be the defender of the faith, and head of the Protestant church, the Anglican faith, meeting with a cardinal Hume in London, both wearing scarlet, which is very fitting, 
And there we have Anglican priests now changing over and joining the system, falling prostrate before the great system of Rome. One of the few remaining outspoken critics of the system, a man named Ian Paisley, who stood up in the European Council and held a sign saying the Pope is the Antichrist, so this would be your radical sort of side of things, has this to say. In order to regain her vice-like grip on Europe, Rome launched her great counter-reformation. The main object was to undermine the belief of the Reformed churches in the very Bible on which they had been so successfully founded. In order to do this, it says, Rome planted her emissaries in the schools where the leaders and teachers of these denominations were trained. And we can certainly attest to that, brothers and sisters. Went to once a Methodist church uh, back in Prince George, not Methodist, sorry, it was a uh, Mennonite church, and went in to do a, an ad for their, for their new opening, and they had this great big building and two volleyball courts built right into the floor of the main auditorium area and would seat 600 people, and um, I suppose if you added a few more, you might get 666 in there, and you know, across the roof there was this great big sound system that they'd taken from the Calgary Olympics, to use for their Christian rock concerts, and you begin to realize these are not the old order Mennonites. But going into the library of the pastor, we noticed his book, I was looking for, is there some sort of typical Mennonite sort of books in here that might be interesting to look at? And no, there wasn't. It was all Zondervan, IVP, and all this kind of stuff. So I asked him, I said, well, you know, don't you have any sort of Mennonite books? Oh, he says, I'm not a Mennonite. He says, I'm a Baptist. I went to school in, in, uh, in uh, Alberta, the Baptist College out there. He says, but these were the guys that were hiring. And so you begin to see that denominations and sects today mean nothing. They have forgotten their roots, where they have come from, who they are, and they're all drinking from the same well, the poison well of the papacy. He goes on to say that after this Jesuit sort of plot was able to get a hold that then started the many pilgrimages back to Rome until today the leaders of the now apostate reformed churches are tripping over one another to slabber upon the Pope's slippers, as he would put it. And so it is that we see this. Great leaders of the Protestant churches, Billy Graham, telling us, well, the Pope, well, he's almost an evangelist. The best evangelical address I've ever heard or a straight address, he says it was tremendous. That was British Columbia, 1983, when we remember the Pope came to visit. And here he is, receiving his honorary Catholic priest vestments, given to him by one of the Catholic universities, showing full well that what Mr. Paisley was talking about has in fact come true. Hal Lindsay, one of the great apostasy shops writers, turning around and saying, John Paul too is, in my opinion, a truly devout person who claims a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And that's all it is to the world around us. Doctrine, teaching means nothing now. Do we have a personal relationship with Christ or not? So protesting has gone away because many, almost all, of the harlot daughters have now become drunk with the wine of her fornication, and have gone back to Rome. And brethren and sisters, let us not drink of the same tainted source that they have. Let us not swallow their doctrines, which begin primarily on the prophetic side of things. The teachings of Alcazar and Ribera, Spanish Jesuits from the 1600s, 1700s, who basically decided that the finger had to be pointed away from Rome one way or the other, as we will spend some time looking at a couple of classes from now. But what about the rituals of this system? We read that the rest of the men, and this is Revelation 9 verse 20, repented not of their works of their hands, that they should not worship devils, idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and wood, and there's the metals of the image, incidentally, again, which neither can see nor hear nor walk. And so here we have a nun kissing the toe of another dead saint, although this actually wasn't a statue of Peter. It was a statue of one of the Roman pagan gods that they dressed up a little bit, moved around and renamed, and so kissed has been the toe of the statue of Peter that you'll notice there 
that it's worn flat. And that's the way it is, that the idolatry of the system is second to none. So that an iron statue can have its toe completely worn out. That's the system that we're dealing with. Unrepentant. There is, of course, those other identifying factors. Cinnamon and odors, ointments and frankincense. Describing the system and how it operates. The Catholic Church has kept this picture alive. We went to a funeral um, for a, uh, an individual at work and I was quite interested to go along. It was the, uh, the boss's mother. So I stood at the back of the, uh, the Catholic Church to get a good look at how this whole thing operates. And there they do all their you know, little in incantations and whatever else. And at one point in time, out walks the priest and there was the altar and he's got this incense and it's right next to the, co the coffin of the individual. They call it, by the way, a resurrection ceremony because they're going to send the soul of the dearly departed off to heaven. And so they bung all this incense into the incense burner. This individual threw a little bit too much and we just had to about clear the place out because it was all smoking up and whatever else. And as you watch what they're doing, I ask somebody, I said, what is it that they're doing? Ah, well, that incense is, is representative of the soul of this individual, as now it's been released by the power of the priest and sent off to heaven. And you begin to realize how strong a hold they have upon these poor individuals who are completely and absolutely duped by this system. And so it is, brethren and sisters, that that's the way the system works. The light of the candle shall shine no more in thee at all. We don't even need to comment on this. The Catholic Church is well-renowned for the candles, the idea of the spirits and the souls burning away in the church. But it was interesting that we did find um, what was called the Holy Fire Miracle in Bethlehem. And what happens here is that this is Eastern Orthodox, which is one of the harlot daughters, probably the closest one. Um, but anyway, they, they enter into Bethlehem, into one of these churches, and the priest goes in, the bishop goes into the church, into a little box that's, of course, locked, and you can't see what goes on, and he's got a candle. And the story is that fire comes down from heaven and miraculously lights this candle. And from here, the priest comes out and passes the flame on. You've heard of the expression of pass the flame. Well, this is sort of the idea. And they pass it through the whole city of Bethlehem and out to Jerusalem, lighting all the, the, the church's candles. And brothers and sisters, this is believed by many to be a miracle. Sponsored, no doubt, by Bick. But, <laughs> I mean, realistically, you've got to think. They know what they're doing. That individual goes in there and he pulls out matches and he must light it. They are fully aware of what they're doing to the people around them. That's how ridiculous it is. But they do it because they love the power and the money and all the things that it brings. The voice of the bridegroom, he goes on to say, and the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee. And of course, there's the whole sacrament of marriage that only the Catholic Church can administer. And if you want an absolution for it, they basically turn around and say, well, the marriage never really happened in the first place. That's the way they get around it and simply absolve this whole thing and it, and it just didn't happen. And that's how they deal with this problem. They disannul it, I think, is the phrase that's used. The doctrines of this system are incredulous. Infallibility, for one. A mouth speaking great things, we think of from the book of Daniel. When the Roman pontiff speaks ex cathedra, he possesses by divine assistance promised to him in blessed Peter that infallibility which the divine redeemer willed his church to enjoy in defining doctrine concerning faith or morals. Therefore, such definitions of the Roman pontiff are of themselves and not by the consent of the church, irreformable. So then should anyone, which God forbid, have the temerity, temerity to reject this definition of ours, let him be anathema. Catholic Encyclopedia, again, 1909. So when he sits upon his throne and speaks ex cathedra, he is infallible. He is, as it's described elsewhere, the voice of God upon the earth. There is the doctrine of celibacy, 
We read of it in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3, forbidding to marry, commanding to abstain from meats. Also, Daniel 11, verse 37, neither shall he regard the desire of women. And so it is, brethren and sisters, that we read in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, point number 1579, all the ordained ministers of the Latin Church, with the exception of the permanent deacons, are normally chosen from among men of faith who live a celibate life and who intend on remaining celibate for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Celibacy is a sign of this new life to the service of which Christ's or the church's ministers are, or is consecrated. Accepted with joyous heart, celibacy radiantly proclaims the reign of God. So it's he that believeth and is baptized, and if you want to be involved in the church, is now made celibate. Uh, these things we find not in the scriptures at all. It speaks against them. And we should recognize them for what they are. You ever wonder why the church has such a problem with pedophilia? With all these priests and the things that they do, the crimes that they are charged with in Prince George, we had a bishop that was basically arrested for such things and tried denying proper relationships and then if you've ever seen pictures of the Vatican with all its multitude of different little boys with no clothes on it's a sick disgusting system and they surround themselves in the things that the Lord God says ought not to be so and they say that this is pious this is something that is greatly to be looked after 2 Corinthians chapter 3 warns of something that would be different from the Jesus Christ that we read about in the Bible it says I fear lest by any means the serpent beguiled Eve, Eve through his subtlety your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ and it talks about that system that's coming preaching another Jesus whom we have not preached another spirit which ye have not received or another gospel he says I fear that you would bear with him and many brethren and sisters have of course, John speaks of the same thing, that every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God, and this is that spirit of Antichrist, wherever ye have heard that it should come, and now is also already in the world. The doctrine of the Trinity, brethren and sisters, is such a doctrine. To back up this teaching, the Church has introduced the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception. It's one of those sort of phrases that perhaps we're not that familiar with. 1854, pronounced by Pius IX, the doctrine teaches that Mary was born free of the stain of original sin. Here it is laid out for us. There's a fresco of the Immaculate Conception. This most blessed Virgin Mary was, from the moment of her conception, by a singular grace and privilege of Almighty God and by virtue of the merits of Jesus Christ, Savior of the human race, preserved immune from all stain of original sin. She was to have a different nature because she was to be the mother of God. And therefore she, not Christ, but she herself didn't even come in the flesh. She was a special creation so that the God could be born of her as they consider her to be the mother of God. Just interesting when we look at that photo or that painting to notice what's under her feet. See that serpent there? There's the stained glass window beside it. Victorious are you, Holy Virgin Mary, worthy of all praise. You are the virgin who crushed the head of the serpent. They rob the Lord Jesus Christ of his victory and give it to this woman, who is not, of course, Mary at all that we read of in the Bible. They believe in another Jesus, Christ who possessed two wills, two natural operations, a divine will and a human one. They are not opposed to each other, but cooperate in such a way that the Word made flesh willed humanly into obedience to his Father, all that he decided divinely with the Father and the Holy Spirit for our salvation. Christ's human will does not resist or oppose, but rather submits to the divine and almighty will. And so the idea that the Lord Jesus Christ did not indeed come in the flesh, that he was not, as the words of Paul put it, tempted in all like points like as we are, yet without sin, but he was of a special creation, so much so that he did not possess the flesh as we know it. Of course, we go on to think of the assumption of Mary. Following on from this, not only was this woman the one victorious over sin itself, 
But finally, the Immaculate Virgin, preserved free from all stain of original sin, all the way through her life, by the way, they do not believe that Joseph was really her husband or that she had any other children. She remained a virgin. That's why they were so up in arms when they found the uh, little sarcophagus of, Joseph, or of um, James, the brother of Christ, or the brother of, of, uh, of Jesus. Goes on to say that her body and soul were taken up into heavenly glory and she was exalted by the Lord as queen over all things and this picture is actually called Mary the queen of heaven well we read about the queen of heaven a few days from now in our readings there we have it in the time of Jeremiah the word that thou hast spoken unto us in the name of Yahweh, we will not hearken unto thee, but we will certainly do whatsoever thing goeth forth out of our own mouth, to burn incense to the Queen of Heaven, and to pour out drink offerings to her, and to make her cakes to worship her. And so, brethren and sisters, that is the system that we're dealing with. It completely and absolutely changes the Gospel, so that even the key players are not the key players anymore. Mary is the one. She is the queen of heaven that all are to look to. Goes on to say that taken up to heaven, she did not lay aside this saving office, but her manifold in, by her manifold intercession continues to bring us the gifts of eternal salvation. Mary does, not Christ. Therefore, the blessed virgin is invoked in the church under the title of advocate, helper, benefactress and mediatrix she is the mediator forget the words of timothy in first of timothy chapter 2 verse 5 that there is one god and one mediator between god and men the man christ jesus they believe that god is three and that christ is not the mediator at all but rather mary now has the role of advocate and mediator Forgetting also 1 John 2 verse 1, My little children, these things I write unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Well that, brethren and sisters, is the system and its doctrines and its teachings that have not changed. They've not changed from the time when the Reformation began. When people for the first time picked up Bibles and began to read them and realized that the church that they belonged to was nothing more than a complete and absolute farce. It was identified in the scriptures as this harlot system. It was identified in the scriptures as the man of sin. It was the little horn. It was all those things, the Antichrist. And numerous of them wrote thesis on this. They died at the stake for saying such things. The doctrines have not changed. But the whole world around us has forgotten. Why? Quite simply put, because this book has been closed and put on the shelf. If they continue to read it, they would still be able to identify those things. And brothers and sisters, if we close this book, if we stop doing our Bible readings, our personal Bible study, proving all things, searching the scriptures daily, whether these things are so, if we lay aside God's word, then we too will end up in the same place. In a few short years, forgetting what manner of persons we ought to be, forgetting the doctrine that separates us from the world around. Well, this system, as we're going to look at in the next few classes, is soon to be destroyed. The words of Isaiah are very telling in this regard. Chapter 25 and verse 7 he will destroy in this mountain when he returns to Mount Zion and establishes the kingdom the face of the covering cast over all people and the veil that is spread over all nations may that day brethren and sisters be soon may it come quickly so that our God may establish the kingdom on this earth through the Son the Lord Jesus Christ rightfully taking the position as the king, the mediator, the advocate, the one who rules all the nations with the rod of iron, as we will see. 
May that day be soon.